So today I'm going to continue with Kazan Zenji's teachings, which is where I, something we've been working on for the past, um, I don't know, a couple of months. So Zazen Yojinki, notes on what to be aware of in Zazen. And we're right at the end of that. And the end of that addresses first sloth and torpor and second um, agitation, working with restlessness and worry. And that's where I want to talk today. That's what I want to talk on today. Working with restlessness and worry. And that's also called in the Tibetan text, it's called um, mental excitement. So in, in the Lam Rim, which I'll also reference today, I'll, I'll weave them all together. Um, in the Lam Rim, it's mental sinking and mental excitement. So um, slightly, you know, kind of adjacent teachings to the teachings on the five hindrances, but also very useful for this particular purpose. So I think I mentioned to you last week that I would be speaking from Kazan Senji's teachings and then also um, lectures by the teacher Gil Fronstal, who spoke on um, working with worry and restlessness. So there, there's my, um, there's your references for you. <laughs> so let's start with Kazan as we did before. If the mind wanders, place attention at the tip of your nose and tandon or your hada, your lower belly, and count the inhalations and the exhalations. So as you know, we practice counting the breath here. We count one breath per both, like per inhalation, exhalation is one. And we count to 10, and then we start again. This is the the base teaching for um, my teacher's style of Soto Zen. If the mind wanders, place attention at the tip of the nose and the hara and count the inhalations and exhalations. If that doesn't stop the scattering, bring up a phrase and keep it in awareness. For example, what is it that comes thus? Or when no thought arises, where is affliction? Or, what is the meaning of bodhidharmas coming from the West? The cypress tree in the garden. Sayings like this that you can't draw any flavor out of are suitable. So I really like the way he puts that. Sayings like this that you can't draw any flavor out of. If scattering continues, sit and look to that point where the breath ends and the eyes close forever and where the child is not yet conceived, where not a single concept can be produced. I'm going to read that again. If scattering continues, sit and look to that point where the breath ends and the eyes close forever, and where the child is not yet conceived, where not a single concept can be produced. When a sense of the twofold emptiness of self and other appears, scattering will surely rest. So I, I particularly love this passage from Kazan. First of all, it's very pragmatic. And second, it's beautiful. So we have that combination of both. And then there's also an element of mystery in the middle of it that sparks something, at least for me. Like, wow, I'm not sure if I completely understand that, but it makes me feel a little bit more spacious. So that's the place that we rest with these teachings as they come in. We let them come in and um, from a place of spaciousness, not thinking about the literal meaning, but sort of let them soak in for us. And I also love this because 
we have the teachings of Keizan Zenji, who's Soto Zen, merging with um, the classic teachings from the Buddha, and then also merging with the Tibetan teachings on the Lam Rim. And um, I see a lot of integration here. So I'm going to talk about that. So first of all, what is it? What is restlessness and worry in our practice? I mean, I think we all know what those words are, you know, because we're alive, you know, in the modern world. So what is it in our practice? What does it look like for us? The word, the root word for this in the classic teachings comes from the word to shake. So here in New York yesterday, we experienced an earthquake and it's something like that. You know, I've experienced many earthquakes, of course, living in Japan and then also um, in Italy last month, I experienced a lot of earthquakes and there's sort of a, an inner shakiness that's like a minor earthquake, not a major earthquake, but sometimes that minor earthquake becomes a major earthquake. You know, when I said um, sometimes life events really influence us strongly, then um, that's like a major earthquake, right? So if we learn to work with the shakiness and develop skills for addressing it, then we'll have that skill available to us when those things come up. So what is it? Um, there's a physical side and there's a mental side. So the physical side, you know, we have a lot of energy. The energy can become kind of compulsive, kind of zippy, like a zzz, 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 where we just can't settle. And I'm talking about in our zazen practice in particular. Um, we get fidgety when we're moving around, there's a really um, funny passage in a book called Tofu Roshi. It's like advice from a fictional character invented by Susan Moon called Tofu Roshi. And she, she talks about sitting next to a person during Sashin when they are compulsively picking the pills off of their sweater the whole time, you know, so it's some, that kind of energy, that need to do something constantly. Um, and, you know, as she implies through that's a, Tofu Roshi is not a real name. It's a joke, you know, um, so as she implies in that, that sitting next to a person who's going through this type of agitation can be very disruptive for us as well. So it's not just disruptive inside, it's disruptive for those around us. And we all go through it. We all go through it. So we must learn to work with it. To, as a reminder, the only way is through. That's it. We can't avoid it. We can't take a bypass. We can't just shut down. We can't change the channel. This is our life. So we must go through. So um, fidginess or an agitation, you know, I think we've been sitting there some many times we've all experienced that where you just feel irritated at everything. It's not logical. You know? <laughs> it's just um, happens. Something's coming up. And so I'll, t I'll talk about the ways to work with it in just a minute. But usually something's coming up for us. We've reached a block in our practice. And this is one way that we are, um, that we're meeting it. And it's a way that's a hindrance. So again, last week we talked about shutting down when we meet these obstacles, you know, just going to sleep or getting really tired or getting sluggish. And now we're talking about when we get kind of agitated when we meet them. So again, there's a physical side and there's a mental side. Um, the mental side, I'm sure uh, many of you have heard the phrase monkey mind. This is it. You know, it's monkey mind is here. It's when our mind is just jumping, 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 jumping through the trees of our consciousness with a lot of energy. You know, my friend has been visiting me this week and um, he came with his 12-year-old daughter 
and she has a lot of energy. So <laughs> there are times where she just, um, I don't know, for example, during dinner one night or after we had eaten, when she decided she needed to um, get 10,000 steps for the day <laughs> and, and decided the kitchen would be a great place to get those. So it was kind of, it was, for me, it was fun, you know, because I was like, whoa, look at her go, you know, but when our mind is doing that, it's not fun at all. You know, it's, it gets really distracting. And even in a way that um, when I've gone through it in the past, it makes me so frustrated. I feel like I want to cry. It just kind of can be just like, oh, stop it. And then when we do that, of course, it exacerbates it. And then there, there can also be an, a really um, exaggerated feeling of vulnerability where we feel really fragile. And the Tofu Roshi um, example is a, an example of that. And I'll use that one because she's making a joke. You know, she's talking about how irritating it was for her when somebody's picking all the pills off of an entire sweater while she's trying to be still, but she's also experiencing that through her exaggerated vulnerability. You know, this, that this irritates her so much about this other person is also an example of what happens when we have um, mental excitement going on. So basic monkey mind, that's it. <laughs> Here we are in monkey mind. We can't focus, we feel scattered. We have certain thoughts that just cycle through over and over and over and over and et cetera. You know, the same movie that we have seen a hundred thousand times that we should be kind of bored with by now because we've seen the movie before. Nevertheless, our mind brings it up again. Um, Sometimes this type of mind comes up with a craving for experiences of peace in our practice. So either we, we've been sitting and we finally experience Zazen Samadhi, where we're completely absorbed and there's no separation between self and others, and we don't trust it. We're like, I got to hang on to this. This feels great. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Okay. St no, uh, st no. St st and then, you know, then there it's gone. Right. So when we do come upon um, states of peace or samadhi in our practice, it's really important. I'm not to analyze it, but to rest in it, to rest in it. You know, I often use the phrase, take the backward step and turn the light within when I think of resting in samadhi, I think of a um, television commercial from when I was a child. It was um, it was a commercial for iced tea, and you were supposed to take the iced tea plunge by just falling backwards into this vat of iced tea, and it was supposed to be so great. And so I kind of when these when these feeling of peace arises for you, whatever scrap of that there is, just let yourself rest into it. Don't grab or try to recreate it. Sometimes we sit and um, things arise and we, we're so distressed by what we're facing in the moment, we want to go to a different place even in our practice. Like, ah, last week I was doing, you know, I was so calm and now I'm not and I'm so frustrated. And then that just, again, this exacerbates it. And that's something I want to stress clearly with working with restlessness and worry, it's very important to address it because the more we do it, the more it becomes a habit, not just a mental habit, but a practice habit. And the more we do it, even when we experience states of calm, the tape is still running in the background. So one more way that it manifests is a constant state of worry or um, feeling regrets. 
for things we did in the past or maybe things we didn't do in the past, but this constant sense of regret or worry. And I think worry is something that we, um, you know, I don't need to explain too much. We all know what anxiety feels like. We all know what worry feels like. And, you know, this is something that's particularly, I think, particularly heightened in our society right now. So on that note, I'd like to talk about some of the causes. An obvious cause, I feel like I want to ask everybody, but an obvious cause for a state of agitation is our phones, you know, just to name it, call it what it is. They're, they're built that way. They're intended to do this to us and they succeed. You know, this feeling of when it's not in our hand, we must be missing something. When it is in our hand, we just look at a bunch of very banal junk. You know, I mean, not that the cat videos aren't fun and interesting, but, you know, I could look at my own cat instead of somebody else's cat on the internet if I really wanted a state of calm. So um, that's, I just want to say that. And the phones are just one manifestation of our restless lives. We live lives that have constant activity. So again, thinking about my friend and his child who just visited, her life is so scheduled mm -hmm. that she needs some kind of stimulus all the time. So even when we went on a walk, we went on a walk to the waterfall and um, she wanted to listen to music or she wanted to do this or do that. And it took her time, but I did watch it happen. As we walked up, her attention shifted from consistently asking for the phone from her dad to um, a sense of wonder about the, the, the trail and the waterfall. Um, some things that she noticed were, for a while, a leaf was following us uphill. And that became our leaf pet. So our pet leaf followed us. Um, what else? Um, so these, these are people who are from London. They're from the city. So she didn't have a clear idea of moss and what moss is. And that moss is a whole ecosystem. And that it's also a friend and a cousin of lichens which are also alive. She didn't know that lichens were alive. And once she learned this, she also saw that there were many kinds of lichens on this trail and, you know, and so on. Things went from there. So her attention shifted from an agitated state to a state of awe and appreciation. That energy is useful to us. We have to learn to use it well. Zazen Samadhi is ours. It's available to us always. And these obstacles block us from what is already ours. So speaking of worry, you know, the more we, we all, I don't think, uh, maybe I don't have to say this, but I'm going to say it. The more we worry, the more I worry, the more worry becomes our habit. And then that becomes our persona, you know? So it's really important to step back from it and not to worry about the things that we can't change or even the things we can change because neither way is helping us. You know, in the classic Shanti Deva um, quote, it's, um, if I can do something about it, then why get upset? And if I can't do anything about it, why get upset? So that right, that place in between, I can do something, I can't do anything, is the why get upset. And the why get upset is the rest, the peace, the samadhi, the letting go. It can be important to discover what triggers us when we get into this very agitated state. Um, 
maybe not to obsessively look, but to invite it to teach us, to to give it the open the door, <laughs> to give it the space to come in and teach us, um, you know, what is it? What's going on here? Um, identifying it can be important because it's going to come again. You know, it gives us a chance to work with it. So maybe it's pent up aversion. You know, some of us are um, hoarders of our anger. You know, we save it, 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 we save it until our whole house is, you know, like a hoarder is full of junk, of anger, and it just eventually just blows up, right? Others um, have other types of triggers that that really can build up. Um, maybe our dreams or our desires or things that we think we should be or we shouldn't be have really built up in us. And that story continues until it just becomes untenable. You know, it's too much of a story and too far from reality. So it's important to address these things as they arise. When we're feeling anger, it's important to learn from it, to look at it closely, to learn from it. Um, to acknowledge that it's here and to work with it. And, you know, I mentioned this last week, and it's also true for working with restlessness and worry. We have the ethical precepts as our guides. So we have these teachings from the Buddha, and we have the precepts to help us when we get into these places. So we have to just remember that and really. Um, you know, embody the ethical precepts so that they're here when we need them. So we don't have to overthink it when these things come up. Um, fear can be a classic trigger for restlessness and worry when we're afraid or nervous. And then finally, I'll mention um, a kind of performative Zen. A Zen that's a lot more focused on looking a certain way than being a certain way. When we try to look a certain way, that's often an outside in, in image of who we think we should look like more than an authentic um, flowering of our true Buddha nature. And these are lessons that are often learned from teachers. You know, teachers who are very critical or expect you to become um, a mini me version of them you know, all of your problems would go away if you just acted like me. You know, that can really create a kind of performative Zen that looks nice on the outside, but um, has all of these uh, states of agitation or, you know, torpor or, or um, sinking trapped inside, kind of hiding. And the more we learn to hide them, um, the more they become a hindrance for us. So then let's move in how to work with these. Um, how do we work with it? Um, in Tibetan Buddhism, well, not just Tibetan, but they often use the word antidotes. I like that word. It's not exactly, a, it's not a cure. It's something that we can do to counter the energy. So the most important thing is uh, really developing the ability to rest in emptiness. But when we're really focused on these worry, 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 it's helpful to spread and rest in spacious awareness. In order to rest in the spacious awareness, we have to have the concentration of following our breath. So when Kazan says to return to counting your breath, this is as a a way of refocusing ourselves so that that spacious awareness is available to us. When we're stuck here and we're thinking, 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 or worrying, it's not available to us. Coming back into the body, coming back into the elements of our zazen practice, counting the breath, bring it back to us. They make it available to us. So this is very important. Um, I mentioned understanding the hindrance well. 
learning about it, how it comes up, not just um, for you personally, but also in the teachings, just like we're doing right now. Staying present to the discomfort is a really important part of this and moving through it with patience, with courage, and with discipline. Sometimes if these things for us are very, very strong, um, we need to seek outside resources. So of course we can talk to the teacher about it and get their advice. Um, other things are, you know, if we have really strong regrets, then maybe we need to attend to that and make an apology. When we're doing a lot of sitting practice of Zazen, especially during Sashin, sometimes our regrets come up very strongly. And right at the end of Sashin is a really great time to make repair. We're feeling spacious and open. We have the energy. I usually tell people don't go for a hundred apologies. Just choose the one that really feels closest to your heart, but do it. And then when you do that, then it feels satisfying. And then you learn and you develop the habit of being able to do that more readily. So they may, if you have a strong regrets, they may need to be addressed. And if you have a, a habit of kind of compuls compulsive worry that's been with you for your whole life, you may want to seek a therapist in addition to your practice as a complement to your practice. I mentioned attention, really paying attention. Paying attention to the physical sensations that arise when we're so agitated. Watching your body need to fidget, need to move, and really noting that, paying attention to that. So this mindfulness is one of the antidotes to a state of agitation and worry and patience, of course. You may recall that patience is also the antidote to anger. So patience is really crucial. Patience can be developed through a spaciousness. Um, avoiding activities that cause us to be agitated. That's important, of course, coming back to the phones. Um, but not just that, you know, if the news really gets you riled up, then step back from it for a while. Unwind. Come to Sashin. We're doing Sashin um, three day next week and uh, five day in the summer. And this is a really great time to unwind from your states of restlessness and worry because you don't have a phone. You're not interacting with others. You're only in silence. Um, you're in nature. So it's a really good time to do a restart. I think that's what I want to say about the antidotes. There are a few more things, but I don't want to just throw everything at you all at once. Um, Kazan Zenji mentions the Zen phrases. Um, these are kind of mini phrases or mini koans. Um, some people call them pre-koans. They're just an essence of a koan. And we hear them in talks all the time. So if you hear a phrase in a Zen teaching or any Buddhist teaching that helps you to let go, then rest with it for a bit. Just let it be with you. Not thinking about it, but just you know, let it sit in your belly and be with you. So I think um, I think that's basically what I mentioned, what I wanted to mention today. In terms of preventing agitation and worry, you know, some things are very obvious. Don't drink too much caffeine. Get enough sleep. Exercise. Eat well. Obvious, but, you know, if we don't do them and then they become a hindrance to our practice, then that becomes a big deal. 
um, living an ethical life, using the resource of our Sangha, our community to help us when we get out of alignment and really letting go of the thinking mind, letting it sink. And I think I mentioned some of the um, unhelpful things that we can do. So I'm just going to mention them very briefly as a recap. Um, looking for distractions, whether internally or externally. Um, substance use is a way that we avoid. We try to calm. You know, maybe we just want one drink and then that becomes our habit. And then it becomes two or using um, different substances, marijuana or different things that make us calm down. Um, they can, if they become a habit, then they can interfere with our ability to face what we need to face. And then I want to mention what I call a manufactured outrage. <laughs> um, it's you're, when you're just kind of, you're having a hard time with your own self. And then something happens in the world that makes you so mad and you get so invested in um, joining the collective anger around this terrible thing that's happening. And it feels good. You can feel empowered. You feel like you're doing something positive and it can be a good thing to do, but maybe without the outrage piece of it, the outrage isn't helpful. So if you're using that as a way of avoiding, then ask yourself, am I creating outrage, whether in society or in the temple? Am I creating discord as a way of avoiding things that are difficult for me to face in myself? Ask yourself the question, and that will bring you back to the place of not knowing. That question mark on the end brings us out of certainty and into openness. And if we hover over the question mark, if we stay resting and not knowing, but inviting the question, we may just learn something, maybe something valuable, maybe something valuable that will contribute to our quality of life as a life of resilience and peace and care for others. So let me just recap. I've um, spoken a lot today. Restlessness and worry is the state of either physical or mental agitation, i.e. monkey mind. <laughs> um, kind of obsessing over something that is not in the present moment, brings us out of the present moment. We must, when obstacles come up, we must work through them, not around them, not avoiding, not creating things that bring us out of the moment or looking to ingest things that bring us out of the moment, but coming back to the moment. And we can ask for help when we need help. Please don't ever forget that. And um, the causes can be myriad. I name some of the causes of restlessness and worry. And I encourage you, if anything I've said is helpful, use it. And investigate for yourself. Come back to that question mark. And use it to learn for yourself. Not only, you know, not just trusting what I've said, but using what I've said as a way to help you figure it out for yourself. This is the best way forward. Thank you, everybody.